The Old Testament lesson is recorded in the book of Isaiah, the 40th chapter. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see, who created these? He who brings out their hosts by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, My way is hidden from the Lord, my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is the word of your Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospels, recorded in the book of John, the 16th chapter. And Jesus said, A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me, and because I'm going to the Father. So they were asking, What does he mean by a little while? We don't know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, Is this what you're asking yourselves? What I meant by saying, A little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, You will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she's delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. This is the gospel of your Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Knowing the context of today's gospel lesson, and that is very important. We've got to keep things in context. So knowing the fact that this gospel lesson, these words of Jesus, were spoken Monday, Thursday evening at the Last Supper to his apostles, Knowing this, it's clear from our Lord's own words that he's pointing the disciples to his imminent death and resurrection, okay? That which is coming, you know, Good Friday to Easter Sunday. You can hear it. You will have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take that joy from you. Good Friday to Easter Sunday, guys. And, and, And it's true, right? In just a few short hours... Jesus will die. He'll be laid to rest in a tomb. The disciples won't see him for a couple days, and they will, no doubt, be filled with sorrow. You would too. However, you know, in, in just, a, you know, just a few short days later, as we know, Jesus rises from the dead. He will see them again, just like he promises, and they will see him again. And they will rejoice, right? No one will be able to ever take that joy from them again. Not the Pharisees, not the Romans, not the devil himself. No one. So we get it. And, you know, as faithful Christians, we also understand how these words apply in a, in a much broader sense. You know, it's not just referring to, not just referring to Good Friday to Easter Sunday. We also understand how these words refer, you know, outside of the three days between Monday, Thursday, and Easter Sunday. Look at the here and now, right? We don't see Jesus here and now, at least not in all his resurrected glory. It's very easy then to feel like we're all alone. There's no denying the fact that we do have sorrow in the here and now, right? I know I'm not the only one. But we also know that you know, this is just a little while. It's a drop in the bucket. We know that there will come that wonderful time when all our earthly sorrows will be turned into heavenly joys. There will come that time, either when we die or when, or, or when Christ returns in judgment, whichever comes first, 
there will come that time when all of this is going to come to an end, when we will then see Jesus face to face in all his heavenly majesty and glory. And that's when we will rejoice. And that rejoicing is going to go on for all eternity. And, and no one and nothing will ever be able to take that joy from us. So we get it, right? We, we understand how these words of Christ apply in the narrow sense, and we understand them certainly in the broad sense. Do you know what? Let's, let's come at this from a different angle. Again, I want you to hear these words of Jesus when he says to his, his apostles, he says, a little while and you won't see me, then a little while and you will see me. Okay, I want you to, to see these things now through the eyes of the disciples, but don't skip ahead to the time after he breathes out his last and is laid to rest in the, that sealed tomb when no one can see him. Now, I don't want you to skip ahead to that. Remember, these words are spoken Monday, Thursday evening. I want you to think of, of that terrible, turbulent time that immediately follows the Last Supper when Jesus is arrested and when he's being beaten up and spit upon and mocked. I want you to think about these words through the lens of those horrendous six hours or so that Jesus is hanging on that bloody cross in between two criminals. I mean, let's face it. If you were tasked with picking Almighty God out of the lineup of all the people who are involved in the suffering and death of Jesus, you wouldn't be able to. I mean, the disciples certainly couldn't see the Almighty in the midst of all this suffering and sorrow, could they? Despite all that they had seen and heard over the course of three years, when things went off the rails that Thursday eve into Friday morning, when things went off the rails, they didn't see Almighty God. No, you know, a little while and you won't see me. They didn't see Almighty God when all this was going down. They saw nothing more than a a battered, bloodied man who was in the final stages of ultimate defeat. So it's not that they couldn't see God. It's right before their face, right? It's not that they couldn't see God. It's that they wouldn't see God. They didn't see God. Their preconceived notions got in the way. They had their idea of what God's supposed to look like, how he's supposed to work, what he's supposed to do. And let's face it, the events unfolding before their very eyes blinded them from seeing God actually at work. So again, understand, they saw God in the flesh right, right in front of their faces. They saw God in the flesh, and yet, full of sorrow, full of grief, full of fear, full of worry, they were blinded to the reality. They saw God, and yet, they didn't see God. And you know what? Let's not fool ourselves here. Are we really any different from these guys? In fact, Maybe the question needs to be asked, are we worse? After all, we know what those guys didn't know at the time. We know the rest of the story. It was still playing out for them. But we know how the story already ends. We also know, you know what our Lord himself says about his promise to abide with us always, even to the end of the age. These guys aren't going to hear those words until his ascension. We know those words. We know what he says. I am with you always to the end of the age. And we know how he keeps that promise of his very real presence with us. We know that he, he is with us in, with, and under his word and sacraments, right? We get it. We can look right here and see he's keeping that promise. And yet, let's face it. There are still times when suffering and worry um, kind of flare up and rear their ugly heads in our daily lives and what do we do? We wind up, we run, we hide, we cry out, we lament. We wonder why it seems like we're all alone. We don't see God. More specifically, we don't see what we want to see. We don't see what we expect to see. We don't see what we're looking for. Just like the, just like the disciples, right? Now, you know, I could go into the many and various ways. I could go into a whole long laundry list of how we demonstrate this sinful blindness in our daily lives, but I'm not going to. Instead, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to focus you on how God addresses such sinful blindness and unbelief, how he deals with this. I want you to take a look at the Old Testament lesson, because remember, there's nothing new under the sun. All right, so uh, the Old Testament lesson, to briefly set the context here, Israel is suffering in hard-hearted, thick-skulled unbelief. Basically, they've turned away from God. They think they're good Christians, but they've turned away from God. They're doing 
what makes them feel good. They're not doing what's right in the eyes of God. They're doing what's right in their own eyes, whatever makes them feel good. You know, in an attempt to be popular and prosperous rather than faithful, they've basically given themselves over to their wicked neighbors, to their false gods. God's beloved bride has turned, in, has turned adulterous. She's become a whore, as the Bible says. But here's the thing. God hasn't stopped loving them. He's calling them to repentance, and he's doing that through guys like Isaiah. The problem is, though, they refuse to listen. They refuse to repent. They refuse to return. And, and things have gotten so bad that Isaiah and the faithful are in danger of losing hope. You know, I, and I get it. I'm sure you do, too. Isaiah's looking around and saying, man, are things so bad? Are things so far gone that not even God can turn these fools around and bring his promise to fruition? These folks are, are hell-bent on doing their own thing. Is this even beyond God's power? This is when God confronts Isaiah in all his fear and all his worry. And God says, look, to whom are you trying to compare me that I should be like him? You know, basically what God is saying here is, look, I'm not like all those other gods or people. You're using this faulty measuring stick. I'm not like those other gods or those other people. I don't even work the way they work. You know, what other god or what other person are you going to possibly compare me to? God then commands Isaiah to look up, count, look up at the stars in the, the night sky. Now, the Hebrew word that's used here in reference to stars is Sabaoth, which means host, really. It's actually a military term. Sabaoth, or host, is a huge assembly of soldiers or angels. You know, for instance, mighty Pharaoh had a Sabaoth of soldiers, right? Mighty Pharaoh had a huge host of soldiers, and they were all drowned in the Red Sea. King David had a huge host of soldiers. We even hear of God's heavenly host, the angels, right? Those mighty beings of light. And you know all this, right? Glory to God in the highest, peace to his people on earth. Yeah, those kind of angels. That, that host, Sabaoth host. So, back to the story here. God tells Isaiah to look up at the stars, look up at the Sabaoth, the heavenly host, and he tells him that he, as Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of the heavenly hosts, he says, look, I march each and every single star out at night, just like the commander of the, the guard, right? I position each and every star in its exact spot every single night. Not one single star is ever a wall. Not one single star is ever out of place, not even a little bit. And you can't help but see how God is also alluding to his heavenly angels. You know, those, those angels who are tasked with watching over us and protecting us. Not one, in spite of what you see all around you, not one is ever a wall. Not one is ever out of place. The point is clear here. Almighty God does this great and awesome thing every single night for you. Something that you can clearly see and behold. I mean, look up at the night sky. Not one star is out of place, not even a little bit. Do you see? You know, and if you can see this, if, if Almighty can do all this without so much as breaking a sweat, well, then what makes you think he can't handle all the other lesser things that have you all hunker down and acting like a doubting chicken little. You know, it's very fitting that these texts, which were appointed centuries ago for the fourth Sunday of Easter, it's very fitting that they're appointed for our meditation today. I mean, look around, guys. God is actively at work, still. Here we stand between the time of Christ's Easter resurrection and, and that day in the future when we will see Christ in all his heavenly glory. Here we are. Here we stand right now in the midst of sorrow and darkness and fear and uncertainty. And to that, your Lord says, look up, right? Look up to him. Look back to the cross, back to the empty tomb. Look forward to the magnificent day when, when Christ returns in all glory, puts an end to all this sorrow and suffering. Um, you know, don't go looking down and navel gazing. He says, look up, look forward, look back. But here's the thing, and I will add, don't just look back, all right? Don't just look forward as if God is 
only the Lord of the past and he's only the Lord of the future, you know, but, but in between we're kind of on our own, you know, good luck. No, no, don't just look back. Don't just look forward. Lift up your eyes and behold, here is your almighty God right here, right where he promises to be right here in your very midst. You know what? Tonight, I want you to go outside and look up. Not one single star is ever out of place, guys. Look up and then remember the fact that God has promised you something far greater than all the stars in the universe for you. I mean, you can hear it right now. You're going to hear it in just a couple minutes. As often as you do this, remember what I have said. This is my body. This is my blood. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I am with you always, even in the midst of your suffering, the midst of your struggling and trials and tribulations. I am with you. I am with you always, even in the midst of sorrow and despair and loss and grief. You know, even when we are surrounded by, even when we are swallowed up in the darkness of sin and sorrow and sickness and, and wickedness and corruption and unrest and, and all the other manners of woe that seem to just be drowning us. Even when we're surrounded by all this, guys, the light of Christ ever shines forth, piercing the darkness and giving to us his joy, his peace, his comfort, his assurance. I mean, look right here. Do you not see? Because it's right here. And I'll say this, if you're not seeing it, well, then maybe it's because you're looking for the wrong things in the wrong places. Repent, repent and turn. Turn and return and rejoice. Okay, rejoice in your very present and unfailing peace, the, the peace that surpasses all understanding. The peace that neither height nor depth nor powers or principalities can, can overcome. The peace that not even the gates of hell can prevail against. Here's Christ. Here is your peace. So may this same Christ-centered peace, this Emmanuel joy and peace, may this peace guard and keep your hearts and minds, and keep your hearts and minds ever grounded in him. And may his joy and peace be and remain with you now and into all eternity. Amen.